Thank you very much for coming out on a Sunday night in Santa Cruz. This isn't a Santa Cruz topic, war and conflict. But nevertheless, here we are. And I thought what I'd do is speak for about 35 minutes and then welcome as many questions as we can get in. These are essays that I wrote. Some have, over the last decade, some are quite new and have never been published. And they have one theme, and that is, whereas human nature is on changing throughout the millennia, warfare itself is mistakenly thought to change every decade. In fact, I try to argue the theme of the book is that I don't think wars change much at all. Sort of like my grandfather used to tell me on the farm that uh, he could push a, I could push a button and get 1,500 gallons of water. He had to hand crank a pump and get three gallons of water. But he turned to me once and said, the water hasn't changed any. The essence hasn't, just the delivery system. And the same is true of high-tech warfare. Because it's a human enterprise, and human nature remains constant through the centuries, the same principles apply, and therefore it's, it's valuable. We don't like to study military history today. In fact, we, we can look at a lot of studies. Uh, there are about 200 peace and conflict resolution uh, programs in the United States, and I think there's five or six formal military history programs. About 1.8 per percent of all professors identify themselves as military historians. Now, why is that? Um, part of it is the uh, post-Vietnam 60s generation where we had a new concept in the West, whereas before, from the Greeks onward, people objected to particular wars, but not necessarily war itself. They, I guess I could use that phrase. Some people thought there, and no matter how horrific war was, there was a certain utility. After all, it could end things like Nazism, Italian fascism, Japanese militarism, chattel slavery, or the threat of war could stop something like Stalinism. But after Vietnam, and also in the nuclear age where uh, war had raised the specter of complete Armageddon, people objected to the idea of war. No longer could, would they agree with the Greeks that the Persian War was good, they were attacked, they were defending Eleutheria or their freedom. Peloponnesian War was bad because Greeks were killing each other. First Punic War was understandable, Third Punic War was bad. But we have sort of jetsoned that idea, and in the modern or postmodern 21st century, we have this idea that all war is bad. That's another reason why we don't study military history too often. Why should we? Because in uh, most bookstores, there's a section of military history, and believe me, it's got more books than race, class, and gen gender sections. It's got more than farming. It's got more even than environmentalism. So the public has this macabre interest in warfare. Why should, though, we formally study war? And I think I'll have to go back to the Greeks for two or three reasons. We should remember that history, historia, meant inquiry. But de facto, it meant inquiry about war. So almost every history that the ancients wrote, who started the formal discipline of history, was about war. Herodotus and the Pel uh, Persian Wars, Thucydides and the Peloponnesian Wars, Xenophon's fourth century wars and the end of the Peloponnesian War, Polybius and the Punic Wars, Livy and the Punic, we could go on and on and on. And note what a theme throughout all of these histories are. Unlike us, they believe that not all events were equal. We're sort of in a relativism a period of relativism where we don't want to adjudicate one event as being any more or less serious or important or memorable than another. Not so the Greeks. Every time they, you start a Greek history, whether it's Herodotus or Thucydides or Xenophon, they tell you why their war is more important than somebody else's war. And they have various criteria. So many people were affected, cities were changed, governments fell. But there's one common theme and that is war itself is more important than other events. It's almost as if time and space are collapsed so that people who are very young and have a long period of their lives to live, give it up. And that's an aberration. Herodotus says the thing about war is fathers bury sons. It shouldn't happen. And so if we could make the Greeks come alive, they would say, yes, 1939 is more important than 1929 even with the Depression. 1944 was a more important year than 1947. 1918 was a more important year than 1911. By virtue of these cataclysmic wars, it changed people's lives and rippled, uh, events rippled out from them as never before. 
So one reason that we should study military history, I think, is because uh, we could go back to the ancient idea that events are different in war. That's when revolutions take place. That's when technology explodes. That's when ideas uh, appear and disappear at rapid speed, unlike peacetime. A second is a moral issue. Um, I was driving over here today to the coast from the valley and past the cemetery, and I think today we're in danger because we have divorced ourselves from our military past. It's not that our young people do not know what Gettysburg is, or they don't know what the bulge is, or they don't know what Normandy Beach is. They don't know what World War II is. They do not know what Civil War is. Much less would they know what Okinawa or Iwo Jima or Bella Wood is. They have almost complete amnesia about all of the 18, 20 year olds, 23 year olds who died so that they could have take out pizza and watch Oprah to be crass about it. So a society that has no sense of commemoration and has no idea that the singular exceptional nation, nature of their own uh, culture is dependent or hinged on a, thousands of people who were willing to die for the idea of the United States, it seems to me that it's a, uh, a very amoral thing to do for an entire generation not to have any commemoration of events in the past when uh, a lot of people wage their all for us to live in relative peace. And then a third, of course, is it's didactic. War can teach us about the present wars and, more importantly, the future wars. It doesn't mean that history repeats itself exactly, but as long as you predicate that premise on the idea that human nature doesn't change, then war in the past will be of some didactic value, as Thucydides said, of teaching us about conflict in the present. That's a very controversial statement, uh, and I discussed that in one of the essays. I had a debate once where a person from a peace and, uh, peace and conflict resolution program got very angry and said that human nature had changed. And I asked him to what degree. Maybe it was brain chemistry through video games or increased nutrition or perhaps we're indoor people. Something had accelerated this Darwinian process so that we're kinder, gentler folk and we're not subject to these age-old appetites and impulses. But he couldn't adduce any proof for any of that. And as we speak, there are about 15 wars going on worldwide. More people have been killed after World War II than during World War II. And so if we study wars of the past, then maybe we can have some notion about how to ameliorate their severity, uh, this, prevent them from being all destructive. And that's the last point that I want to take off now and just walk us through some of the essays in the book in a chronological fashion about war in general. What starts them? What makes them actually break out? How do they uh, evolve? How do they end? And what we can learn from them. First thing that I think the modern mind uh, is just intent on, wrongly, is to try to find a material reason for every war that breaks out. There has to be oil. When I was a student over here at Santa Cruz, everybody told me there was oil off the shore of Vietnam, and that's why they were there. In Korea, there must have been oil off the shore of Korea. But so often, the study of wars in the past show us that there's almost no material reason. There can be, but believe me, Germany, for example, has about three million people more than it did in 1939, and it's got about 20 percent less territory. Does any German talk about Lebensraum today? Do you hear the Germans saying, if we just don't have Poland, we can't survive? You don't hear it. I know that the Falklands was a silly war. Borges, the great novelist, said two bald-headed men were fighting over a comb. But if you think about it, <laughs> there may be some oil off there, but that was not about material resources. The Japanese are quite successful today without resurrecting the co-prosperity sphere. Saddam Hussein has uh, all the oil. He had all the oil in the world without going into Kuwait. And Iran today has 200 years of natural gas reserves. There's no reason why they need nuclear power. They need nuclear power about as much as North Korea does, which, whose people were eating grass just a decade ago. But if we go back to study wars in the past, we, we start to see some disturbing trends. That They tend to be about perceptions of honor, perceptions of fear, perceptions of self-interest, irrational appetites and motivations. And so Germans had convinced themselves by 1939 that they had to prove something uh, to themselves, to the Poles, to the Czechs, to the British, to the French. 